I would love to hear from each of you how you came to this project and what attracted you to the stories and the characters um, who are in this story. So if we can start with you, Rebecca, that would be great. Yes, you can start with me. Um, I read the book 13 years ago at a moment when I was speaking more honestly, openly, acceptingly about the mystery and ambiguity around my family on my mother's side. Pardon me, I don't mean to stare, but I think I know you. Claire? Mm -hmm. Lots of people pass all the time. It's easy for a Negro to pass for white. I'm not sure it'd be so simple for a white person to pass for color. This is my husband, John Bellew. Does he know? But you dislike Negroes, Mr. Bellew. No, 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 not at all. I hate them. <laughs> We're all of us passing for something or other. Aren't we? My mother, you know, I grew up in England with my American mother. She's from Detroit, Michigan. But there was always a sort of mystery around her racial identity. You have to put it into perspective. I was sort of grow, you know, growing up in English fancy schools where people, you know, posh English people arrive in their Range Rovers and et cetera, et cetera, and people would look at my mother and say things like, wow, isn't she so exotic looking? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gives you some kind of feeling. <laughs> yeah, it gives you some kind of feeling. And I, when I asked her about it, or I would say something about it, or it would come up, like, you know, for example, when we were watching Imitation of Life together, for example, um, she would say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's possible that we're black. It's possible that we're Native American. I don't really know. Someone handed me this book because increasingly I found myself in situations, specifically in America, actually, for whatever, for what it's worth. It's worth quite a lot. Um, sitting in rooms where people made assumptions about what I am based on what they're seeing. And I found myself increasingly not being comfortable with that and sort of sticking out my hand and, and awkwardly, honestly, awkwardly saying, I think I might be mixed race. And someone handed me this book and said, this is going to help with what you're trying to articulate. And I looked at the book and I thought, passing, what does that mean? <laughs> I honestly didn't have the word. And when I read it, it was instant context for me. It was instant understanding. It was, it was one of those moments when you go, of course this explains why there's this mystery, this denial, this secrecy around this, asp this thing in my family. Because any history of passing in a family is necessarily hidden. It's necessarily erased. A family protects. They close in and they lock down and they don't talk about it. That's what my mother inherited from her father. It gave me, the book gave me a context and a framework from which to address my own racial identity. It also gave me a context and a framework to think about identity full stop, <laughs> period. Sorry, as you would say. <laughs> it, the book is extraordinary. I couldn't stop myself adapting it the moment I finished reading it. Like I shut the book and I, st I opened the laptop and I started writing a screenplay. All the big ideas that you see in the movie, black and white, 4-3, complicated soundscape, in interior, all these sort of sensual, quiet moments, the silence of the movie, those were all ideas that I had on my first read of the book. And went into the first draft of the screenplay, which I wrote 10 days after reading the book. Yeah, it wasn't very good. <laughs> Don't give me too much credit. It was a first draft. <laughs> it was a first draft. <laughs> But it had the big ideas in it, and I think the big ideas, frankly, frightened me. I thought, this is too much. No, I can't make this for my first film. It's too formally ambitious. It's too big. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than everything that I could possibly do. So it sat in a drawer for six years, and then after that six years, I spent trying to think about writing other screenplays, trying to direct other films, because I've always wanted to be a director, P.S. Um, I didn't have as much clarity of vision as I did with passing. So I went back to it and I thought, yeah, why not actually? What am I doing? Just make this, you know how to make it. 
So I started showing it to people, and then, then it was seven years of trying to convince people to give me the money. Um, and everyone saying no. I mean, literally, everyone saying no. Everyone saying this is unmakeable. You'll never get this made. Maybe you will if you make it in color. Maybe you will if you change certain things, if you take away some of the ambiguity or you shift some of the roles. I mean, it, it was, every step of the way was very difficult is what I'm saying. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting because the feedback I would always get would be this sort of, there would be a cognitive dissonance about what I was hearing because people would say, wow, what an extraordinary story. What an extraordinary, isn't it amazing how universal it is and how it explains all of our struggle to define ourselves and I must go and read the book. And I'd say, yeah, great, so you're gonna give me the money? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found Nini Young Bon Jovi and Forrest Whitaker who were our two extraordinary producers whose literal MO is to do the things that everyone says no to. And they did not say no to me about anything. They let me make it exactly how I wanted to make it. I, I want to come back to that. Sorry, yes. that was a big answer. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, no, it was great to set the context and to really help us frame and understand what it took to get it up. Um, and we, we all know that this is a struggle to make films, um, but sometimes, you know, really hearing the details are, are important. Um, Tessa, what about you? Oh, I can't follow that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ruth and I made a very silly discovery today. We've been doing press all day, and behind us there was the graphic that was passing, and accidentally my elbow was in front of it in the frame, and it just said, assing. And I was like, well, that's a different film. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I told you I had nothing eloquent to contribute <laughs> after that. Beautiful answer. It was huh? a good segue, though. <laughs> <laughs> Someone back there likes sassy. Um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's it's uh, it's really means so much to to be having conversations with audiences here. And I know it's still as evidenced by all the mask wearing. It's still um, you know tricky to get places. So thank you. Um, what was the question? The question was around why we're here. Yes, yes. Um, I read this uh, quote today, this Nina Simone, I was like sc scrolling on Instagram and, um, and I didn't hear, I had never heard this quote before and I'll butcher it so I won't say the whole thing, but she said she constantly has to re-examine her identity to herself. Um, her intentions, her convictions, why she does the things that she does. And I think something really compelling about doing this project was a chance to re-examine my own identity and also to make something that hopefully asks audiences to re-examine theirs. Because of course there is this layer, this idea of, of passing uh, in a racial context, but I think there's also this idea of all the ways in which we pass, which Irene says to her friend Hugh. Um, and I think so often we're put into boxes uh, and, and oftentimes by ourselves, right? To fit squarely into them, we're afraid to sort of spill over. Um, and so I thought that examination was really incredible. And then the chance to, I've just admired Rebecca's work for so long as an actor. Um, and not surprisingly, you said today something that you feel like you always approach your work as an actor sort of like a director would in a way. The, you're hyper aware of the macro of a story, not just the micro. And I can see that in your work. And I knew that taking on a character like Irene, both to do justice, hopefully, to Nella Larson's beautiful work, and also, if you've read the book, it's the interiority, it's so dense, you know, what she's thinking and feeling. She doesn't know, always have language to express it. So that challenge, and I couldn't imagine doing it with someone, um, anyone else, just because you could do that as an actor. And so I thought selfishly, she'll help me do it. Um, and, and then also that you had real skin in the game, you know, meant a lot that you're re-examining your identity inside of writing this piece and making it. And then the chance to work, I knew that Ruth was gonna play Claire and it's so important that Irene finds, finds Claire absolutely beguiling and I do find Ruth Nega absolutely <laughs> beguiling in everything she's ever done. And I knew she would be in this. <laughs> uh, 
And then um, an embarrassment of riches because Andre Holland came to play and, and he's someone that I had wanted to get to do more work with. We got to play together in Selma but not have a lot. And one time we sat and read Shakespeare together and he was, he's so tremendous. So it's just been a dream to get to work on this. Um, <clears throat> well, myself and Rebecca had been sort of bumping into each other on the, um, the old press circuit. And um, she had been talking to me about something she was working on. And then we eventually met in New York. And um, she talked about directing this adaptation that she had done of the book. And I love the book. And she talked about it like how I felt about it. And, you know, I saw uh, a mirror in her of how I felt about this book viscerally, at how, you know, you know when you read something and you keep having to put it down because it's so mind-blowingly speaks to you. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt about this novel and the characters in it. And Rebecca felt the same way. And the sort of fierceness in her and passion and intensity of her pitch to me uh, was so intoxicating. Um, uh, and I was just intoxicated by it. Um, and I thought, this is, these are the kind of artists that I want to work with, you know? The fire in the belly. Uh, that's when it's mm, at its most exciting, you know, when you're joined by sort of comrades with that fire. And I just thought, I just left at that opportunity. And, you know, it's, it's really rare that you read uh, portraits of women, and especially women of color, of such complexity and ambiguity and nuance, you know. Uh, both of them, I'm sort of repelled and attracted in, in equal measures. And, that, you know, that's how we feel about humans in nature, you know. And you really see it reflected in, in work, in scripts. And that translated from the book into Rebecca's screenplay, and it like vibrates off the screen, you know, when you watch it. And it was, it was, it was essentially the novel and Rebecca's beautiful um, allegiance to the work, really, to, to Nella's work, that, um, yeah, I was gonna be involved by any means necessary. Love it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Andre, please. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, all the reasons that you all have already said are the same things that attracted me. Rebecca, I, I was a fan of hers for a long time. Saw her in As You Like It many years ago. And I saw that too. You saw that play? <laughs> me she too. She it. The way she, yeah, anyway, we'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, I mean, that, that her work on stage, you know, really, really uh, floored me. And so yeah. when the opportunity to be a part of this came along, it was an easy yes for me. And then also, getting a chance to step into this time period. You know, I'm, I um, got to learn so much that I didn't know about this time. And, you know, in addition to discovering Nella's work, which I didn't know anything about, I also bumped into a number of other writers from that time period who I didn't know about, which uh, has been a real education and a joy for me, so. And then to work with these fabulous folks. Yeah. <laughs> All the bonuses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rebecca, I want to come back to you because this is your directorial debut, so congratulations. <laughs> and you're also an actor, so you get the language of actors. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, some of your choices and going back to some of the things that you said earlier, your insistence on this being a black and white film, your insistence on the specificity of casting. Um, and the way in which you know you made your choices, um, even with lighting and the cinematography, can you talk a little bit about your process as a director and what what was important to you? What were you really trying to draw forth in the film, get people to really pay attention to? Sorry, that, that's an that excellent question. No, <laughs> no but the, it, I, I was about to launch in, and then you said, "What was important to me?" And I was like, "What wasn't important to me?" <laughs> and then, like the whole. Every step of it was so, felt very important on many levels. I, the black and, I'll start with the black and white. It was always, it was always an absolute. Like there was no other way to make this movie for me. 
And it's, and it's not about it being literal. It's not like, oh, we're dealing with a black and white world, therefore it's black and white. It's actually about our perception of that literalness. Because it's a nonsense. <laughs> Nothing is black and white in the world. Nothing is black and white on film. Black and white is gray. It's a thousand shades of gray. But it brings into light those categories. It makes you think about them. It, it abstracts it. It makes you see all the binaries that exist in the film, of which there are many. There's black, white, man, woman, gay, straight, rich, poor. It's touched on all of those things. And within all of those things, you also see the limits of it, that no one can be reduced to one definition, and invariably our messy humanity spills out the sides if we try to. And like the black and white element, as well as being metaphorical in that sense, also allowed us to play with shadow and light and tone so that nothing is really fixed. And it was very important to me to cast two recognizably black women in the roles. Not, I mean, I, when I say recognizably, I mean so that you come in at the audience, you have a fixed sense of their identity. You have a fixed sense of their identity as two black women. Because from there, the film has a place to destabilize your fixed idea of that. And I can only do that in black and white. If you take a scene like in the beginning in the hotel room when John, the husband, is there, like that scene is deliberately oppressively white. The walls are white, the costumes are white, there's huge amounts of light coming in the side of the window. He doesn't see that they're black because he's dumb or unobservant. It's because in this domain, it's his world, he has all the power, so he gets to see what he wants to see. And you are always seeing them as black. You are always in that perspective and you are always fearing for them and you're seeing, why can't he see what I'm seeing? It, it, it's about context. I, I mean, I love that people watch this film and some people are like, I see this. And other people are like, no, I see this. I'm absolutely right. No, I'm absolutely right. And it's like, well, none of you are really right because it doesn't look like the real world. So, <laughs> you know, but the, it forces you to come into confrontation with that assumption that idea of perception and context and all of those things. Um, the aspect ratio for three is sort of similar in that, you know, again, this thematically is dealing with putting people in boxes. So I literally put them in a box. I wanted them to feel, I wanted the film to feel cloying and constrained and claustrophobic. You know, it's every bit as much about Irene's experience as it is about Claire's. It sort of says that about this is the, it's about a woman who is hiding her racial identity. But the real turn of the whole story is that it's actually about the one who's not hiding her racial identity, but is arguably hiding everything else about herself. And she is so constrained by her sense of how she is meant to be. She has put herself, in essence, in her own box. She is so concerned with what kind of performance. You know, I'm speaking, I should let you speak to this, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> but you're right <laughs> although you know what's funny you've said so many things about Irene and I never feel defensive but today you said that she couldn't she can't decorate her own house because she doesn't know who she is and I was like wait a minute I like that couch it was like the first time I was like <laughs> well, that was specific because I remember having this conversation with our production manager a uh, production designer the great Nora Mendes who's fantastic Incredible. and she she was sort of telling me about all this historical detail and saying, oh, you know, in the 20s, everyone had very busy wallpaper and clashing print on the couch and everything. And I was like, yeah, I love all that stuff, but Irene's house needs to feel not entirely lived in because she doesn't really know how to express herself, let alone, like, put something on the wall. So it was about finding a minimalist way, but I know that's going to upset you. Ruth was a good you. friend because right after she said, oh, she's talking about your interior decorators. <laughs> As Irene, I was like, yeah, that, that rubbed me the wrong I way, too. The yeah, you did. <laughs> a la Claire. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I love how you use all of the elements <laughs> of the film to, to bring out this examination of identity and, you know, who people are, who they aren't, who they think they are, who they think they aren't. I think I said that. But... Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to ask Tessa and Ruth if you could talk a little bit about this relationship that your two characters have because, you know, obviously the film is examining race, but there are so many other things, motherhood, um, friendship, uh, 
being a partner and your each character's sort of like internal journey around those is overlapped by your interactions with each other. So I wonder if you could talk, if you could both talk a little bit about what that was like working with each other to explore those, all of those different themes. Where do we begin? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I suppose, I suppose our performance is sort of inextricable, really, aren't they? Because they're sort of dependent on one another. Um, it's interesting, really, because um, my job of being sort of this sort of, I don't know, mm, charismatic, bewitching kind of character is really was Tessa's job to find me that way. Do you know what I mean? And because it's interesting, really, when in the film, you sort of think, really, Irene is the only one who is really captivated completely and utterly by this woman. You know, the way she speaks about Claire is quite hyperbolic. And, you know, people are sort of, you know, attracted to this woman. But it's, it's Irene that has this sort of unnatural obsession with her or attraction to her. In trance sometimes. Yes. Like <laughs> and that's... Um, so you're sort of seeing your character through lenses, through prisms, through lenses, through prisms. And so... Um, so that's, to me, it's sort of, it, that in itself lends layers to my performance without me really having to do anything. Um, and I found that really interesting and I love that idea because I do feel performance by its nature is, is a deeply ensemble thing, you know. It's where you're reliant on your fellow players, you're reliant on your crew, you're reliant on the weather, how you're feeling that day, all of this beautiful alchemy comes into play. And, and that kind of is the scary thing, but the beautiful thing. And you know, we, we, did, we did our prep beforehand and everything, and we managed to have discussions and such. Um, but I think, you know, as with so many things, um, it's really about exploring what's happening in that space in between between action and cut, and what you both as individuals doing your prep and as people bring. And that to me is exciting. That's a thrilling way. So I don't know if I can sort of, I don't know how to articulate that so much, you know? It's sort of too visceral. Chemistry. Is that a cop out? No, that was good. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, just thinking about how your two characters, they need each other for it to work in, in, in each scene and even outside of the scene because you understand each character based on their interaction, your interactions with each other. And, and I think, you know, you both brought that out in your performances in the film. You know, we can see there's so many times where um, Irene has this tension. It's like you're holding all of your thoughts back. And like you said, if the, the, the text itself is so rich with her internal monologue, but you could see it all happening. I wonder if, did you draw on some of that for, to, to, to sort of like build your character or was there anything that you, that you thought about in your process of you know, thinking about all those moments? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Um, I, I typically am not uh, like write a ton in the margins. I think everything that exists in the margins usually exists inside you or it's not noteworthy or something. But um, in this case, there's, it's so dense. So when we were playing a scene, for example, the first time that they see each other, she writes you know, so specifically about this very central experience in a way. For example, she smells her before she sees her and she hears her laugh. Um, and so I would reread the passages. I had you know, things, Nella's exact words, charted and Rebecca and I went through a you know a pretty specific process together charting every single moment of the script because we shot this in 23 days it's wow. not um <laughs> yeah whew. that's amazing in and of itself that deserves a round of applause yeah, we so we had very little time and um we shot out of sequence of course the first I think our first day is Andre and I in the car together um on the way, having that sort of, you know, argument that is like a, a 
you know, a, a deeply lived in argument for them that they've had over many years. Thankfully, we knew each other, so we had a relationship, but still, you know. So we shot out of sequence, so Rebecca and I worked really precisely um, around that. But Nella's words, for me, I kept returning to them. I think for some people that do an adaptation, maybe you sort of depart enough from the source material, you kind of have to let it go so that you can feel free. But for me, I think there was such precision in the work, A, because we didn't have much time, because of the aspect ratio. If you were on off your mark a, a little bit, sometimes you were literally out of the frame. We were working in a pretty precise way anyway, so I sort of treated the, um, the novella in a way like another piece of music, you know, that I was playing these notes inside of the passages. Um, and I could track that. Whether or not the audience could is, I, c I don't have control over that, but certainly for me, like I've only seen the film once when we saw it in New York and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I hope, well, it looks, I'm thinking something. And, um, <laughs> and I can trace it to, to what Nella told me I was thinking, for me. I don't know about you all, but I, there were some moments where I was like, okay, I guess that, it looks like I'm thinking. Um, but yes, I returned always to the source material. And as Ruth said, I think the performances are so um, symbiotic in a way. I mean, hopefully performance always is. But especially with this, because the film itself has such restraint. There's such monotony. You see her on the same walk throughout the seasons. You see her in her same chair. You get the sense, you know, what Irene says to Brian. She says, you're a lot less content with what you have when she's not here. She's talking about herself. Because when Claire's not around, the world lacks uh, electricity. And so I, f I felt free to have a kind of restraint in performance uh, to, to be measured, you know, to not be able to hit those extraordinary high notes all the time. Because I knew that she was going to barrel in and do it. And that was cool, you know, it's like a two man show, but with one man doing things right. for the other. Speaking of one man, <laughs> there there is one man. <laughs> and your role, Andre, is, um, is, is also intermingled with these characters um, very intimately. And I wonder if you could talk about, there's a lot of ambiguity there, <laughs> right? You know, in terms of your, your relationship with each of the characters, can you talk a little bit about what that was like for you to live in the ambiguity? <laughs> perform in the ambiguity even? I ain't do it, y'all. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I ain't do it. <laughs> but there are times when... <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like, today we were doing press and every single woman that came in was like, let me talk to you. <laughs> the way you looked at that woman in that living room, I know you were up to something. I was like, no. Uh, Nah, it was fun to play with the ambiguity because it's ambiguous in the book, it's ambiguous in Rebecca's screenplay. And, you know, I have my personal feeling. I, I personally feel like he's a man who loves his wife, has always loved his wife. They are maybe in a moment where they're missing each other. They're not quite connecting in the way they used to. Um, and I think Claire's arrival ignites. Uh, it brings a warmth and a heat back into the house, which he enjoys. Uh, but I don't think he was, he was up to nothing. That's my story, and I'm sticking right, to right, it. Right, right, <laughs> And he's done, folks. <laughs> um, there's another moment between um, you and Irene that I want to explore, this, this moment. You talked about um, you know, being able to go back into the literature and into that time period, but it's really interesting how a lot of the themes in the film in this, in this text that was written in 1929, they still resonate today. You know, that whole conversation about um, whether or not your children should be exposed to this conversation about lynching. I found so interesting because of the things that Irene is also grappling with, right? So there are all of these things. So how did you two sort of like work through that scene and how do you think how do you think it's relevant also to some of the things that we're talking about today? I like, I like when you talk about this. 
Well, I'll start, well she I'll asked say, you the question. I'll, I don't know. She was looking at both of us. Anyway, both, both, both of you. Both of you. I'll <laughs> say a little bit, then I'll pass to you. I, I think you're. I feel the same way that it feels uh, uh, sadly relevant, yeah. uh, and and you know it reminds me of conversations that I had with my parents when I was growing up. Uh, right. The whole like this is the talk. We've been yeah, talking. yeah. 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 And. Uh, yeah, that was one of the things that really drew me to the part is reading that scene on the page. I was like, I know, I know what this is. I've been here before, and you know, I'm not a parent yet, but um, I imagine that there will likely be a day where I'll be here again. Um, and yeah, it's sad that that is the case. That she was writing about that in 29, and we're still talking about it today. But um, but I feel like uh, I feel like the the film has a lot to contribute to that conversation. Um, Anyway, it makes me sad to think about that scene, to be honest with you. But uh, but I'm I'm eager to hear what you think, TT. What you think? Well, I think I we were so excited to shoot that scene. Remember, it was like a yeah. Um, I think a lot of things because you know Irene has this sort of moral high ground in terms of being a dutiful member of the black community, and I think her resistance to talk about the quote race problem means that she's actually disconnected from a huge part of the black experience in this country which is to acknowledge that our bodies are not safe and um, her resistance to helping her children understand that um, also to make them more safe is really um, interesting you know it's another way in which she passes in a way, she's, she's available to her blackness in some very specific ways. She's even available to sit and talk to allow blackness to be um, fetishized with her friend Hugh, you know? But she cannot talk about the real experience of being black in this country. And I think, you know, I think it's really easy to imagine that you'd always be on the right side of history. And I really loved that this work required me to interrogate that in self, you know, to look back at other times and think about how I would have shown up in them, you know, because we're, we exist in a time now that we'll, people will look back on and say, how did you show up? Um, and so I really like that. It's really easy to, to sort of put things in the past and I loved that there was such modernity to this conversation. I don't love it because it's saddening, it's angering, but I like that we have to, we have to re-engage with these things. Um, we can't allow them, I think so often, particularly with narratives about, uh, around race in Hollywood, it sort of packs it up neatly and goes like, there were some bad people, <laughs> and then there were some great people that were fighting, and I know uh, who I am. And um, do you, like, do we? Or how can we be sure? Um, and so I liked that. And then also I love that it's a very domestic fight in some ways because they also are fighting about not what they're fighting about, mm -hmm. you know? He thinks he's having a conversation about race and how to raise their sons and she's having a whole other conversation and that happens so often sometimes in relationships where you're not really fighting about the thing you're fighting about, you're fighting about all the other stuff underneath. And that, I thought there was such richness, um, which was also exciting because so often we can place things into one thing and particularly in terms of the black experience we don't get to also have the thing be about relationships and all that murky territory you know yeah there's so many things yes thank you so I think we are at about time um, but I just wonder just Rebecca to give you the last word um, if you can just say a little bit more about why this story still resonates, written in 1929, and we're still able to, you know, sadly, yes, um, draw these conclusions on so many different levels. But you know, why does it? Why do you think that it is resonating so loudly? This conversation about passing race, relationships, and who we are, just how we show up. I think, sort of crudely speaking, I think that. This sort of notion of how free we are to form an identity will always be relevant. Mm. Because whoever we are, we all go through this thing of 
the tension between the story that we tell the world about ourselves and the one that the world tells us about ourselves. And even beyond that, we go through this problem of, I think I ought to be this sort of person. Like, how much of the world stuff have we internalized? How much do we know? So, so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much of it. And certainly, under systems of racism, and patriarchy, and all the rest of it, it's like degrees of this become amplified and less amplified, more amplified, in all sorts of different ways. But that is fundamentally true for all of us. Mm. You know, we're all, we're all negotiating that. And I don't think that goes away. So I think something that forces you to think about that is important. And I also think that the film, I hope that the film, it's my intention that the film doesn't do much work for you. You know, it's whatever you show up with, whatever aspects of your identity you're carrying when you interact with the film, that is going to inform your experience of it. And it's deliberately silent because it was the only way that I could think of, amongst a couple of others, but it was the most significant way that I could think of, of signaling you, I'm not going to tell you what to feel. You've got to lean in and do the work and think about this. Because you'll get more out of it that way. If you just sit back and, excuse the pun, take it at face value, <laughs> you're only going to see the surface and you're going to think, oh, well, this is just a film where nothing really happens. But if you apply yourself and lean, think, think and work, there's an awful lot of richness. There's more richness than I can even tell you because you're all going to have a million different interpretations of it. You know, there are some of you that are going to think it's all about repressed homosexuality. There are going to be some of you that think it's all about adultery. There are going to be some of you that think it's all about internalized self-hatred that's born out of racism and the patriarchy and God knows what else. They're all true and they're all meaningful. And the fact that two of you might have a very strong opinion and then get into a conversation from both ends of that means that you're entertaining nuance and thinking about the gray areas. Thank you. Well said. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, Tessa, Ruth, Andre, for your work for your creativity, for your courage in making this film. Um, the, the production team, creative team, cast, director, writer of Passing, everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody, for Thank coming so and for staying. Thank you.